Okay, Neil, wonderful to see you again. Uh, welcome back to MIT. It's always great to have you here. And thanks for giving the last lecture here in the Metaverse class. I'm Joe. We have Valentina Hiroshi here and Kathy and Daniel, who are the TAs, and a uh, wide class of uh, students and interested people that are accumulating online and in person. So it's great to get your perspective. Um, I've got a, a, a few questions I can start out with. And then we uh, may have some questions from the other class conveners and welcome up to the class and have a discussion during the time. Um, so this is the obvious question to begin with, right? Uh, you were the first person, as everybody says, in 1992 to coin the term metaverse. I mean, before that, we had cyberspace, but that became the internet. At least that's what we used it as. A metaverse is, is something that starts to feel fresh, the way people are using it. You began it. You had ideas for what that should be. What do you think it is and where do you think it will go? So. Give us, give us your perspective and, and look forward. Yeah, at the time, I mean, cyberspace, you know, Gibsonian cyberspace is a more abstract kind of mathematical realm um, of, of sort of pure data. And um, um, it doesn't preclude having avatars and face-to-face -face interactions, but that's not really the focus of it, at least in, you know, like Neuromancer. So, um, what happened with, uh, in my case, was that I had been working for a couple of years on a project to um, to make a graphic novel um, using computer graphics, um, which, you know, it, it was at, at the time state of the art computer graphics. So it was like a Macintosh 2 with a 480 by 640 color screen. And I had souped it up with some transputers and, and, um, and so on, and was programming it in uh, Macintosh Programmers Workshop. And I had um, I had this monitor. I needed a multi-sync monitor for some reason, so I had this monitor that weighed close to a hundred pounds, and you know it cost me over a thousand dollars. And um, so at the time, my reaction to the whole thing was that it was incredibly promising. Uh, and people were just starting to sort of do those renderings. Remember, there were those classic ray tracing demos of like flo floating mirrored balls, you know. Um, and um, so we were just on the threshold of being able to depict three dimensional scenes live in computer graphics. Um, but it was incredibly expensive and hard to work with. And so um, I just kind of asked myself, what would it take to make this medium as cheap and ubiquitous as television is today. Um, and the metaverse was my guess. That was my answer to that, that question. Basically, how could we popularize it? How could we make it a mass medium that would appeal to lots and lots of people? So it's compared to like classic cyberspace, it's more, um, more aimed at a popular audience. You know, it's got games in it. It's got kind of, uh, you know, sort of a carnival atmosphere. Um, and um, um, so that was kind of the, the rationale that, that got me there and that caused me to kind of coin a different word for it. Um, you know, what, what then actually happened was, you know, a couple of things I didn't see coming. Um, the, um, the year after Snow Crash came out, um, Doom was released and um, the World Wide Web started, 1993. Um, and um, I mean, to make a long story short, those both created a huge surge in demand for computers that could show better imagery. Um, and, and brought the, the price of that kind of hardware down to consumer levels um, a lot sooner than I had um, expected would, would be the case. Um, so that's kind of the beginning of an answer. I feel like maybe I should pause there and let you follow up or... I think, uh, actually, any follow-up to the beginnings of, of Neil's Metaverse? Any, any questions from any about the, about the origin? Uh, I, I find okay. it interesting the distinction you had just mentioned is the cyberspace as something where the person is removed. So the personal perspective is a thing that you look at, but you're not in it. And and here you, you say, hey, that, that's not a complete story. Like you are in it. 
You have to be in it. You have to be part of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is a complete story. It's just that I didn't think it was a story that would appeal to billions of everyday users. You know, the cyberspace in Neuromancer is designed for hackers, you know, who are using it as a tool to access big databases and get around um, security precautions, um, which is great. It's great for that. Um, it's just... Um, it's not something that uh, people are going to adopt in the same way that they adopted television during the 1950s. Yeah. Um, oh, 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 just really quick. Go ahead, Daniel. I just want to ask, sorry. Uh, you say that Snow Crash was going to be a computer-generated graphic novel. Is that accurate? Uh, not quite. Um, no, no. There, was a, there was a precursor project, a graphic novel with a different title. It was called Dioxin. Posse, and it was a more of a. Um, at at the time, it was only a couple of years after Zodiac was was published, um, and so there's other people in the room who can speak to that. But the um, I was still kind of fascinated by um, by that theme of of toxic waste and sacrifice zones and all of that, and so the initial um, the graphic novel project was set in that kind of an environment. It was kind of a follow-on in a certain way. Um, and um, and there was basically one character, maybe two characters, but the, the main character from that project that carried over into Snow Crash was YT. Um, and um, so we actually just had an auction at Sotheby's at the beginning of March, where we sold off some of the original artwork that we produced uh, for that project. I was working with a, an artist named Tony Sheeter. Um, but the link to Snow Crash is just that um, in order to get the hardware of the day to do the stuff that we wanted to do, I had to write a lot of original code. And I went way too deep down that rabbit hole. Um, and um, and when we finally sort of came to our senses and realized that the graphic novel project was never going to go anywhere commercially, then we just kind of scrapped it. And then I just sort of went off on my own and wrote wrote the book, which does use that one character, but otherwise is an entirely original thing with completely different new set of, of characters and situations. What year did you envision Snow Crash to be playing out in? Um, you know, at the time, I was thinking of it as kind of a alternate present, um, you know, maybe just a few years in the future. I didn't see it as being um, as being terribly far in, in the future at all. Um, and um, since then, more recently, uh, I've been working on kind of a uh, an updated timeline of the the Snow Crash universe in which um, it basically happens during 2022. So it basically happens today. Um, but at the time, there was no strong opinion as to when it was happening. You didn't require the BCI like, like Gibson did, uh, the brain-computer interface, necessarily. Because th those we didn't have, and we still don't have them. Right. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, it didn't. I mean, the, the new technology that it posits is, you know, um, a thing that, that uses lasers to draw images on your on your eye. Um, and um, the um, it's pretty vague. It's kind of deliberately vague about what the what the input device is. I didn't want to get hung up on um, trying to. I mean, the book takes off fast and and goes and. I just didn't want to stop for 20 pages describing an input device, you know, you know. Um, you're still active in Metaverse. Uh, you've got your own concern that, that's dealing with it now and, and other things. Where do you see it going? So look, what are you disappointed about? What are you excited about? And where do you see this all? Be, what, what do you see it becoming? Well, I think it's a little early to be disappointed about anything just because it's only with literally within the last year or two that the technological components have really come together um, to do anything like this. So, you know, we needed um, we needed 
uh, head mounted displays that were good enough um, to um, for people to tolerate them. And we um, we needed kind of the underlying software technology of um, that makes uh, MMOs work. And you can't have that until you've got kind of ubiquitous high speed internet uh, in order to create the content that that fills the metaverse, you've got to have game engines that are up to the task and the game engines are useless unless you have tool chains that can feed assets into the game engines. Um, and um, even there, the, um, you know, the a, a, a few years ago, those tool chains all would have been proprietary and expensive. You know, now we've got things like Blender that, um, that you can just download and, and use. Um, so um, uh, really the, um, it hasn't been feasible to, to do anything like the metaverse until, until pretty recently. So um, the, um, I mean, the, uh, whoops, the, um, the, the, the key kind of, I think crossroads where we're, standing right now is trying to figure out what the business model is um, to make a, a metaverse work. And um, the kind of default business model that um, everyone's used to is um, social media platforms that are free to join, free to use. Um, and um, those have obviously made a lot of money and become very, very powerful. Um, uh, but there's a downside to that type of business model that I think everyone's becoming increasingly uh, sensitive to. Um, so, um, um, so maybe that'll be it. Um, but um, the, um, the the real kind of problem to be solved is goes something like this. Um, nobody's going to use the metaverse at scale unless there's experiences in the metaverse that are worth having that are fun to have seems like kind of an obvious thing to say but a lot of times some of the demos and um like early applications that we've seen don't seem to, to recognize that like having meetings you know in in the metaverse um well, no, but everyone's already sick of meetings, you know, nobody gives a shit about meetings. So like to, to, to use the metaverse to have meetings might seem like a, uh, a, a kind of logical business proposition. You know, if you're pitching it, you know, in a, a corporate strategy session, um, but it's not going to cause millions of people to run out and sign up, uh, for that experience. Um, the, the people who know how to make highly enjoyable immersive experiences by and large work in the game industry. Um, that's what games are. And, um, you know, some of them are happily and gainfully employed and some are struggling indies, you know, so there's a range of experiences they're having, but basically um, the metaverse doesn't come together unless those people can get paid. Um, and so how do you come up with a, a you know, financial structure that allows people to get, to get paid when and if the stuff that they create is discovered and adopted and loved by large numbers of, of people? Um, you know, and, and so it's, a, it's either going to be I mean, just simplifying things a lot, you can funnel all of the money through one central company, one central exchange, or you can try to go decentralized. I think we're going to see efforts made to do both of those. Um, Lam and Awan, the company I co-founded last year, is, is a decentralized open metaverse kind of venture. Um, and... Um, um, I, I I personally think that's a, a more likely way to do it, a more likely way to to succeed.
Yeah, yeah. It's the artist dilemma, but a very important one now that we have all these other channels. Um, one, one thing that, that we've been intrigued about here, there's a whole other way to look at metaverse as well. And that's to give you a fuller connection into reality. It's kind of a true names vision at, at some level. Um, but uh, you know, it does lead into augmented reality. There's a continuum where you can move back and forth. Do you see a future to connection to the real world as part of uh, what you would think the metaverse is? Or is it really going to be creative content and, and gameplay or whatever that becomes? Um, the, uh, I, I was at, at Magic Leap for five years, you know, which, which is, it's a augmented reality, you know, see through a device, uh, that overlays imaginary content on what's really there. Uh, I think that's generally a better tool for engagement with real world stuff. Um, and curiously, it's also in Snow Crash, you know, there's a whole separate category of people described in Snow Crash called gargoyles who are kind of, they're doing AR as opposed to VR. Um, so, um, you know, uh, engagement with, with real world stuff is, um, is for sure um, important and something I, I'm, I'm interested in it's just um the uh you know i would just point out that and until now the the most successful most popular applications of immersive technology have been games um and games generally exist to take you to an imaginary place good um we agree there's a we, we there's a market and an understanding that games already do have a presence there and it's something that will increase but i think it will affect lots more things and it's just a matter of what gets there first and what follows but speaking of that let me let me shift gears a little bit and talk about the other element in the room in your novels at least the, the ones i've read ai doesn't play that strong a role uh, diamond age it was more of the augmented chatbot of the kind we've had for years and years where humans are kind of behind it at some level it's changed. I mean, 2022, 2023 are the years when we've always wondered when the year is we have AI. This is the year. We, we have something. We don't know really where it's going to stop. Um, what role is that going to play in the mid? What do you think about it, number one? Number two, what role is that going to play in the metaverse, do you think? Um, I've been working with um, a company called InWorld AI that makes AI driven, or they make a platform for creating AI driven virtual characters um, that are more, more interesting and more realistic than what we've seen until now in video games. <clears throat> so we're having some fun with that. I, I, um, for me, the um, why it's interesting is that it's a new way to um, to immerse people in a fictional world um the um a, a lot of the um uh, ai systems that have made a lot of new news and, and got a lot of attention um <clears throat> I, I sort of have trouble understanding why what what all the the fuss is about like i guess i mean the um like uh, uh the um the ones that make images um mid journey and and you know stable diffusion and those um seem to be kind of it's just a highly organized way of ripping off artists and depriving them of a livelihood so um I don't like that. You know, I don't like that business model. Um, I think it's unethical. Um, and, um, and and I see a lot of, um, you know, as a an artist of a, a sort who's had a lot of exposure to how things work in games and in, in the entertainment industry, I, I feel like um, the people who run those businesses um, all ultimately see creatives as an annoyance that they would like to get rid of as soon as possible. 
And <clears throat> so these systems are great for them. Um, and um, I personally find the output of them to be devoid of interest for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that everyone I know who's gotten excited about these image generating systems um, immediately posts like a hundred images on their, their, their feed. And because it's free to produce them, they don't feel the need to exercise any editorial judgment. They, they generate a hundred images, they put a hundred images out. Um, and so the, you know, that's not how you get quality. Um, and, um, and the other thing is that I just think that when you're um, looking at a piece of art, let's say, what makes it interesting is that you're in a kind of communion with the person who made it. So you can go look at a painting by Leonardo da Vinci and you can see the brush strokes on the canvas and say, wow, you know, he actually touched that with his, with his brush, you know. Um, and um, when there's no human behind it, no human agency or decision-making behind it, then that is absent. Um, and um, the, uh, um, the, the, the AIs that generate um, written material um, are, so they're, they're sort of generating a document that seems like that seems similar to other documents that they've ingested and 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 digested, um, but um, there doesn't seem to be any way to um, to to sort of pin those outputs to to facts. And so um, you can get these things to generate very plausible seeming um, answers that are completely hallucinatory. Um, so, um, so I guess uh, I guess I'm a skeptic of it. Um, I really don't see what the why people are so excited about it yet. Um, although I do think that there's it does open the door to certain kind of creative uh, forms of creative expression that didn't exist before, like. What I mentioned before, using it to to drive um, AI driven uh, characters. Um, speaking of of this, one of our students suggested that I ask ChatGPT to ask you a question. I figure, what the heck? I'll try it. So it spit out a bunch of things, which are kind of formulaic questions anybody would ask you, because as you know, it's trained on you know questions people probably did ask you uh, or ask other authors. But one of them is is interesting. Well, maybe not interesting, but if you if you tweak it a bit, it is. So ChatGPT asks, how do you approach research for your books, and how do you balance historical accuracy with creative license? Probably thinking about your historical fiction novels. But I paraphrase it a bit, maybe. How do you get your ideas? I mean, Stephen Baxter, for instance, is devoted to new scientists. He just reads it every issue. He gives them all kinds of crazy physics ideas, and they'll crack into a novel somewhere. At least that's what he what he said. Uh, where do you get your inspiration, your ideas for your, your work? It's just different every time. Um, <clears throat> the, um, there's no like algorithm to, to be followed, um, to, to do it. Um, and, um, I mean, by the way, that is like the most commonly asked question. So it's exactly <laughs> what you would ex expect an AI to, to come up with. Um, the, it just, um, a lot of times it's, something that I've been following for for a few years that I'm kind of interested in. Um, and uh, and then suddenly something kind of self-assembles inside my head. Um, and, um, and I realized that that there's that there's an idea there. Um, that's how that's how it happened with Reem D. So the, the idea behind my book Reem D started with an incident that happened in the early 2000s where a, a Filipino kid created a, a virus that went worldwide um, and, um, and led to all kinds of unpredictable consequences. And so that kind of planted a seed in my head that came together later with some other stuff I was thinking about. And I said, oh, okay, I, I know what I'm going to do and I know it's going to work. 
in other cases, um, <clears throat> like with um, termination shock, um, you know, I had been following um, geoengineering uh, for a few years, just as kind of a general topic of interest. And um, um, I went to, uh, I don't know, I just suddenly realized that that there was material there for a, for an interesting story, um, be, basically because there was there was conflict. Um, I mean, you know, when, whenever you look at the discourse around geoengineering, it's um, there's just a lot of 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 angst, you know, a lot of of, uh, of disagreement about it. Uh, but it's an incredibly important topic. So I thought, okay important topic, interesting technology, and lots of people in conflict with one another. That seems like um, the ingredients for a book that, that people would read. Um, and so that's you know, different every time. You got the, uh, the, the idea going beyond that, what happens when you turn it off? I mean, you can do it. <laughs> what are the side effects? You can think of a few, but if you turn it off when you're addicted to it, it's a different world. Um, I'll ask one more question that came actually from Denny Hillis, a friend of both of ours, I think. He uh, asked me uh, to ask you, when you first thought of Snow Crash, did you think of it as a book or as a piece of software? Um, you know, at the time, I mean, I had written a huge amount of software for this project that I was describing. It was a big coding project. Um, the, um, but but it was always a book. It was always, um, um, and once I made the decision uh, that I was gonna um, write a book about this, um, it all fell together in that format. And um, I basically, um, there were just a couple of things that came together. Uh, like I said, there was there was the pre-existing character of YT and then, uh, that made me think, okay, I've got this character who latches onto people's cars and um, rides behind them on the freeway. So from a storytelling point of view, the, the, the next element that I need is somebody that she latches onto, you know, uh, and the experience that that person is going to have. And, um, you know, and, uh, Again, storytelling is often about conflict, and so what's um, what's the natural conflict that could arise from that situation? Well, if someone's in a hurry to get somewhere, um, and suddenly they're being latched onto by this courier, then then that that works. And so from there came the whole um, the whole pizza delivery thing, and it just it just kind of rolled forward out of that. Um, but yeah, it was uh, once I once I started, it was unquestionably a, a book. Uh, that idea, by the way, uh, after read Snow Crash years later, gave us the concept of what we call parasitic mobility: things latching on to vehicles and other things, including people, and then getting off somewhere else. So you don't harvest energy necessarily from mobility; you harvest mobility. And uh, we've yet to see it really pan out, maybe drones on mother ships or something. But yeah. it's a strong idea and it's still unfolding. Um, let's open it up a bit for questions. Go ahead. I have a question that forms a little bit in our conversation from you both. I tried to put myself into the beginning of the 90s. Um, I mean, there's this, this movie Terminator came out, I think, early in the 90s. And suddenly the idea that we could build images that represent these crazy machines and so on. And a lot, and you mentioned Doom came out, the internet came out, like there was a momentum, right? There were signals in the air that kind of would generate these kind of visions probably. And you created this really strong vision that, you know, points so far into the future. So with that in mind and that the time frame. So now we're at 2023, we have the pandemic behind us, we have all this stuff going on. Like if you are now in this moment, what are the kind of signals that, I mean, you're probably an extreme good catalyst of these kind of signals to create these kind of visions. What are the kind of signals you would see right now that you would say, hey, that, you know, that's the friction, that's the conflict in the world, that's the kind of 
technology that comes up? Like what points us forward right now? Yeah, the two things that I kind of worry about, the two like mega issues are polarization of society um, caused by lack of a shared belief in reality um, and um, carbon. And um, so I worry a lot about both of those. Um, I don't have great ideas about the first. I don't know. I mean, I... Um, I, I talked to Jaron Lanier a lot about, about that, about social media polarization and all that stuff. And I kind of, in a lot of ways, draft behind him in terms of um, how to think about those issues, but I don't have, uh, I haven't found kind of any technical fix that, um, that I think is very helpful. Um, in the case of carbon, I do think that that's a problem that's amenable to, to technology. And I, I think that, I think we're going to solve it. And I think we're going to solve it with a lot of big, big new industrial capacity whose purpose is to, to clean things up, basically. And um, I think it's going to be the biggest engineering project in, in human history. Um, and the, you know, we we just have to do it. We don't have any any choice. So um, so I'm interested in that, and you know, I, I'm actively working on it in a small way. It's social polarization and uh, decentralization at the same time of government and things like that appeared also in snow crash. They were they were early hints of what that could be there too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't see social media coming. You know, I was all in terms of a, a cable TV, which is, in, you know, cable TV, certain cable channels are definitely a factor in social polarization, but that's all I had uh, in, uh, in Snow Crash. Yeah, yeah, you had the affinity groups that were independent of geography, so on and so forth. Um, good questions, Daniel. Um, I, am a, a, I am a big fan of um, your vision of uh, the language as a virus and code and how that functions in your work. Uh, I'm always inspired by William S. Burroughs and his method, the cut up method, how that kind of pioneered a way to think through creativity. I have two questions. One is, how do you think about the influence of something like the cut up and creativity and how AI functions now? I know you kind of talked about that in a way critically, but I'm curious if there's maybe a productive application for drawing from different sources and generating new content. Um, and then secondly, we have a sci-fi library in the Media Lab. Will you donate books to it? Think about it. <laughs> My books or other people's books? Uh, specifically queer, LGBTQ, brown, black, um, diverse writers like Octavia Butler, maybe your books too. And yes, your books. I, I have his books. I'll <laughs> donate them. <laughs> but well, we we need you know diverse books. So, um, the uh, I'm I'm pretty poorly versed in contemporary science fiction and, and fantasy. Uh, you'd be you'd probably be shocked at how little uh, of that I've I've read. Um, yeah, there's various reasons for that, but um, so I don't know if I have much new to to offer in that vein uh nicola griffith's book from last year's spear is absolutely something that should be on that list uh and um matt ruff's got two books out in the lovecraft country universe the original lovecraft country and the new one destroyer of worlds came out a few months ago uh, so I think those have both punched that ticket for you uh but the only reason I know about them is that the writers live in Seattle and I know them. Um, I'm just totally out of touch. Anyway, uh, similarly, I don't know about the cutout method. I don't, I don't know what that is. This is the first I've ever heard of it. Um, sorry to say. So, um, so I'm not sure what the, um, what the applicability is to, to AI. 
So maybe your question from the audience, and maybe a question from chat. Anybody uh, got a question from New York? Yes, here. No, sure. Go ahead. New York, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, first time when I was reading the book, uh, it was a few years ago, I've been blown away with the concept of the hypercards. Because uh, we are doing the augmented reality, and I just like realized that we are creating eventually the hyper cards with the augmented reality. Because like a small tiny business card can tell a lot about not just about the company, but can offer also additional content. And we came up with the idea to within the perspective of the NFTs to create a line of the hyper card that is on the chain. And someone can get the access to that content. Let's say it's an overlay on $100 bill that, as an NFT, you can own. And in our ecosystem, you can overlay because you get the access to it. But we didn't publish it because it was not ethically to use the hypercards term as it's been coined by you. So this is kind of like the offer if you would like to learn more about this. We There's no obligations nothing to do from your side but we would love to put this in type of cooperation yeah that wasn't me that was um i was just checking the dates here the um hypercard um was a mac application that uh was is a bill atkinson brainchild that uh was released um in 1987 um, so it was new. It was like that term, that idea was like in the air at exactly the time that I was working on, um, on the, 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 the snow crash, the, the project that eventually turned into snow crash. And so, um, all that I did in that case was to say, well, okay, this seems like a idea that might have some some traction. So maybe in the future, everyone will just call these things hyper cards. Um, and so since it seemed like a currently hip term and, and, you know, of the moment, I, I just, I just used it. Because it was fascinating because with augmented reality and virtual reality thing. I, I'm not sure if I got the whole question. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. okay, you're just saying it was something between augmented and virtual reality. Okay. Uh, is there another Yost, you deserve one. Go ahead. Uh, we're gonna have to come over to the mic. Yeah, it's all the all right. Uh, Neil, I'm enamored with the Diamond Age's early commentary on the matterverse, the idea of synthetic islands and synthetic fauna on the one hand, so tangible media as a way of representing and creating new realities. And at the same time, your commentary, criticism of AI in the power and role of the human reactor in creating an emotional bond with uh, a remote anonymous listener. So those two, the idea that it's not just meta virtual reality, but matter versus physical synthetic reality. And this, 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 this the, the ultimate failure of AI uh, as a tool, for example, for teaching or familiar bonding, right? The Nell Miranda relationship. Can you comment mm -hmm. on those two and where you see those super themes headed? Yeah, I mean, the uh, the the idea that the, that came from was that we had a kid um, and we got a mobile to go over the crib, and the mobile had cards. So the kids lying in the crib looking up at these cards moving around and and they had like, you know, one was a circle, one was a square, one was a triangle, and they were very big, bold, blocky images. Uh, but then the, it came with with more advanced versions of those that you were supposed to swap out. So in like two weeks, you're supposed to pop off the cards and throw them away and snap on new cards that had finer details and, and better resolution because the kids visual system at that age would have improved to the point where they could see those things. And so I just took that idea and thought, okay, well, what if you just, you know, had something up a learning system that would just take that to, you know, to the extreme. 
And um, the uh, the idea of a um, of a sort of magic book emerged, and um, the um, and then I had to come up with a technology that was capable of doing that. Like, how could you fit that much computing power into a book? And this was a long time ago, right? So today it doesn't seem like it would take that much computing power, but back then I thought, well, okay, the people, you know, Drexler and Merkel and so on, who are pushing the idea of molecular nanotechnology, you know, there's a way to put infinite almost computing power into a small package. So that's how I got to that element of it. Um, and then the, um, the that bond that you're talking about between Miranda and Nell was just a sort of an outgrowth of conversations I started having after Snow Crash came out. I, I started bumping into people, um, the, the people who worked on Habitat, which was an early uh, metaverse system. Um, and uh, Dean Tribble, who's now at Agoric, um, Mark Miller, uh, so early cypherpunks who um, who had been thinking about virtual communities, and they had figured out that you couldn't make those, you couldn't build a metaverse without having somebody else's code execute on your machine. And so they had figured out that to do that in a secure way. Uh, was going to involve building all kinds of cryptographic infrastructure that would make it possible to do that and, and setting up a way to do anonymized transactions over an open network and you know all of the stuff that seems almost self-evident to us now. But back then, to me anyway, they were new ideas that that these people were were talking about in a very convincing way. So that just listening to that, from the point of view of being a storyteller, I thought, well, okay, what if you had such a link, uh, an anonymous link that couldn't be traced between two people uh, who had found each other and formed a bond in some way, uh, but they, they, because of the anonymous nature of how everything worked, the only way that they could communicate was through this sort of fictionalizing medium. Uh, to me, that just seemed like uh, an obvious, um, you know, powerful piece of story material. Um, and so that's how that got in there. And it's just, you know, that was one of these books where just one thing led led to the next, you know. Um, and so um, um, then it was, well... If you have the magic book, why not make lots of copies? Because lots of people need an education, and you know, um, you can't have live reactors. You can't have a one-to-one -one mapping between the reactors and the the people being educated. So, okay, now maybe we need AI. I don't know. Um, that was just one of those books that that kind of grew in the telling. Um, maybe a question from the chat. Is there is there one that's, that sticks out to you guys? I don't know if that's okay to ask. I think Dini asked a question about um, if oh, wait, you... Can, can you take off your, your mask? Yeah, yeah. Um, what's your thought on us living right now in a quote-unquote metaverse? Your thoughts on the simulation theory of giving you a sci-fi offer and what, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> oh, on the idea that, that we're living in a, a simulation? Um, and just yeah, a question on this theory, not to say like if you think that's real or not. Sorry, I, I stepped on your the beginning of your question. Just, just your general perspectives on that. You don't have to say that, oh, this is the actual theory or not. Yeah, I took a stab at it in uh, fall or dodge in hell, um, you know, with the, the central gag of which is that, um, spoiler alert. Um, you know, people people build a simulated reality to live in after they die, and then it's suggested that that maybe that's it's turtles all the way down, I guess. Um, so um, I mean, it's a it's a fun idea to um, to play with. Uh, you know, I 
I look to um, David Deutsch quite a bit. Um, his book, The Fabric of Reality, um, I think does a great job of exploring, you know, sort of the, this notion of what level of computational power would you need to, um, to simulate the universe uh, at full resolution, you know? And, you know, maybe it's a computer as big as the whole universe, in which case, What's the difference? Um, <clears throat> um, so it's um, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a it's a fun idea to to play with for sure. It's great. We, Range. We talked, What's that? Uh, we, we talked uh, last time you here talking about space. Uh, we both don't believe that there are aliens, at least uh, within you know any any appreciable distance that are of any sophistication for various reasons. But one of the reasons may be this one. Uh, where a uh, you know, path of progress is to retreat into virtuality. virtuality. Uh, the allure of that could be so strong, that's why we don't see them. I mean, do you think there's any feasibility to this or uh, they're just not there? I saw something, uh, I can't remember who came up with this. It might've been Kevin Kelly. I, I, I hate to quote ideas without attribution, but... Um, Basically, the gist of it was what could make it worth worthwhile to cross interstellar distances. Like, if you've got the ability to do that, you've got essentially godlike powers. Um, you know, so there's there's no conceivable resource that we have on our planet that's worth traveling across light years to to come and steal, um, and um, you know what could possibly be unique enough to to make it worth that that trip and you know the answer is ideas like you know if if intelligent people on other planets come up with um, ideas that are uh worth being exposed to um then then maybe that's something that um that space aliens would actually bother to do so they come to steal our IP. <laughs> yes. Or just have a conversation. Yeah, I, I, love, I love that idea. Because you don't have to travel for that. You just have to wait a while and uh, maybe get the information back. Bandwidth. Yeah. So, uh, good. I think we're probably about it at time, Neil. Uh, we could go on forever. This is so wonderful. I got to have you back at MIT physically at some point before too long. We love it yeah. when you. Uh, thank you so much. And we look forward to your next books too. No, thank you. Yeah, I've, I've enjoyed it uh, as usual, Joe, and, and um, talking to all of you. So um, so for sure, yeah, I'll let you know if I'm swinging through uh, through Boston uh, again and um, and we can uh, we can get together and do something. Yeah, we look forward to it. Thank you, Neil. OK, thanks, y'all. Bye bye. And that ends the Metaverse class.